Hello, and welcome to the sixth webinar in a series of online activities about ocean sewage pollution. My name is Kristen Mays, and I'm the Reef Resilience Network Manager and your host of today's webinar panel. This webinar is brought to you by the Nature Conservancy with support from the Reef Resilience Network and NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. During today's panel, we'll learn about sewage mitigation work in Latin America, Africa, and the United States from our three guest speakers. You can see their pictures there. We have Jenny Mighton from Coral Reef Alliance in Roatan, West End, Honduras. Paul Sturm from Ridge to Reefs to share about work in Guanaca Bay, Puerto Rico. And Jackie Thomas from University of Sydney, who will share about work in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Also joining us today is Stephanie Weir. TNC's Senior Scientist and Strategy Advisor, and Steph will be moderating our panel discussion. As a reminder, this webinar um, is, is really part of a, a body of work for reef managers to help address the threat of ocean sewage pollution. So in addition to the webinar series, we're creating web pages on the Reef Resilience Network Toolkit, case studies highlighting sewage monitoring and management strategies, and an online course to help managers build understanding on this topic and the many ways that they can act. Each of the projects that we're going to learn about today will be featured as case studies in the network searchable case study database. So we'll share them with you as soon as they're ready so that you have access to additional details about the projects that we won't be able to cover in today's um, brief presentations and panel discussion. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar will be an hour. It's being recorded and we will be sending out that recording to our mailing list after the webinar. We'll also post it on our website and post it in the network forum, which is our interactive online community of reef managers and experts. There will be, so I'm sorry, um, we're gonna have the brief presentations, then we'll have a panel discussion, and then like usual, you'll be able to ask questions directly to the experts during our question and answer session. There will be an opportunity for additional question and answer after the webinar on the Reef Resilience Network Forum too. There are two ways you can ask questions during the question and answer session. As you can see, you can use the question box anytime throughout the webinar to send questions and we'll keep track of those and ask your questions for you during the Q&A session. Or you can raise your hand during that session and we'll call on you so you can ask your question out loud yourself. If you're having technical difficulties such as trouble hearing or seeing the slides, please go ahead and type a message in the question box and we'll do our best to help resolve the issue. Each panelist is now going to share a brief presentation of their sewage pollution mitigation work to help set the stage for our panel discussion. And so Jenny Mighton will be our first panelist to share about her work and kick us off. Hi, Jenny. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. So again, Jenny Mighton from the Coral Reef Alliance. Um, our mission is to save the world's coral reefs. And one of the ways that we're doing this is through, um, you know, clean water for reefs, one of our initiatives. Next. And before I go on, I want to say that this is a collaborative effort, you know, and our main partners are here. It's the Healthy Reefs for Healthy People, Bailing Conservation Association, and Polo's Water Association. Next. So where are we? <laughs> we're on the island of Roatan. It's off the north coast of Honduras, and we're part of the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef System. Roatan has a population of about 100,000, uh, but it receives more than a million tourists a year, and its annual tourism income is about 490 million. So its tourism is a very important part of our economy, and our tourism is centered around diving and snorkeling. Next, please. So now we're bringing it down. This is West End Roatan. West End is a site that we've been working on since 2005. Um, it is a, it was used to be a sleepy village, but it has grown into a tourism village, again, centered around uh, dive tourism. 
So when we first started working here, um, I can tell you that there was no sanitation at all, no, no type of infrastructure or community infrastructure. Everybody had septic systems, but those septic systems um, um, could vary from a three-chambered septic system with a leach field, which is a great system, or it could be a cesspool, or it could actually be a pipe right going straight into the ocean. Um, also, at that time, West End had a really poor system of potable water, so you weren't getting much potable water at all. The quality of that water was um, questionable, and the frequency and the distribution was not equitable. And the management body for this water system was also uh, weak. So we started working together and got support from you know, all of the stakeholders in the central and local government and were able to build a treatment facility. Next. So this is our treatment facility and I, I love this facility. Um, it is an aerobic system. Uh, it goes up to secondary treatment and we do have plans to improve it and make it up to a tertiary system. So we're actively fundraising for that. But we have made improvements over the years. Uh, and as you can see now, we have solar panels on it, which is allowing us to, to reduce the electrical costs because as an aerobic system, it's very uh, energy uh, heavy. And so with this, next please. Because of this treatment plant and the work that we did with this, so the treatment plant was built, but only the mains uh, were connected. So no homes or businesses were connected by part of this project. So we had to heavily fundraise to connect the community. Now we've got 98% of the community connected. And because of this, we actually saw an improvement in the marine water quality. We had been monitoring the, the water quality for years, and that's why we started to work <laughs> in, this, uh, in this role, because we knew that we had some serious issues. Um, but through the connectivity and through the wastewater treatment facility being functioning appropriately, we were able to get a blue flag beach recognition. So this recognition um, is given yearly by the Ministry of Tourism of Costa Rica and Honduras jointly, but um, it's based on monthly water quality, so sur survey results. So you can lose this if you do not uh, comply to standards. Um, and we're the only populated beach in the Bay Islands that have this uh, recognition. Next. Here you can see the results over the years and the decrease that we've seen really after 2018 uh, when we were able to get the majority of the folks connected you can see now we are passing EPA safe swimming standards. Um, that's really good because now I can take my daughter <laughs> to that beach. Um, exactly and next and this next slide is the one that gets me the most excited because it really shows that sewage uh, management best practices are an important tool uh, to manage and to improve the reef, the health of the reef. Here in the area of influence of the wastewater treatment plant and using the Healthy Reefs Initiative data, they, they gather uh, agri data every two years, um, we were able to see that the incidence of disease went down to zero in the areas of influence. So it's this shows us that it's a very important tool. And we also had a decrease in macroalgae from 27% to 24% in the area of influence. So yes, this is a very important tool. Um, next. And happy flushing again. Sanitation works and it is a cornerstone of managing your reef ecosystem. And thank you. Thanks, Jenny, for that presentation. Um, we'll now pass it over to Paul to learn about uh, what's happening in Puerto Rico. Hi. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Paul Sturm, and um, I'm the executive director of Ridge to Reefs, a small nonprofit organization focused on, on green infrastructure and sustainable agriculture. Um, and we work in the Caribbean as well as the Pacific, uh, including uh, Puerto Rico, where this project is, as well as Hawaii, Palau, American Samoa, um, as well as some other places. Um, and so I, I guess a little bit of background. We've been working in the Guanica watershed for some time, and it was uh, a focus of the U.S. Coral Reef Task Force um, a priority watershed initiative um, to do some planning there. And I, and I think 
once we sort of delved in, we saw uh, a lot of the challenges that were there, and one of them was wastewater. So um, I'm going to talk about a, a, about one of the projects that we've done there. Uh, next. Um, and, and so anytime when we're doing watershed planning, one of the first things we do is we start to look at the whole watershed. And you can't necessarily see it here, but we looked at about 20 or 30 stations across the watershed to try to identify where some of the nutrients may be coming from. And this, gra this graphic kind of shows you some of the areas that we were seeing, particularly in the tidal area, um, and some of the hot spots that we found. And so this particular hot spot, we had high ammonia, we had high bacteria, uh, we had high detergents uh, that also are an indicator uh, of wash water. Uh, we had high nitrogen and high phosphorus levels. Um, and you can see that the bacteria levels were very high. Um, next. And, and so the, the kind of the methods that we employ uh, when we're doing wastewater work, um, we try to create natural conditions that nature uses to uh, treat pollution, convert uh, nitrogen to nitrogen gas, for example, um, using bacteria. So we try to create the conditions that denitrifying bacteria um, that are optimal for denitrifying bacteria. And then we pass the water through that area um, for say 12 to 24 hours and try to maximize uh, that natural denitrification that can happen. And then we also use things like filtration and incorporation to help um, take ammonia to nitrate um, and be able to treat the full spectrum of pollutants, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus, are some of the, some of the ones were particularly Im important in terms of coastal areas. By using sand and biochar and vegetation, that vegetation also gives us evapotranspiration, helping to reduce the volume of effluent that's you know that has to be discharged or has to be put into the ground. And so ultimately, uh, what we try to do in a lot of cases is, is try to get to a a place that we can create almost a zero discharge system so we're having minimal or no impact on the on the environment next um so one of the areas that that we identified and you saw some of the data from that uh is is an area just outside this hotel guanica 1929 and this was a kind of a historic hotel in the area um, 27 rooms um, and a restaurant uh, located on the shores of Guanica Bay. Um, and it's likely that their septic system has been overflowing off and on for, for 50 years or more. Um, and the project uh, created a treatment system that could handle up to 6,000 gallons per day. And so what we did is we did some calculations as to how many gallons per day uh, folks you know, staying there we're likely to use. Um, and one interesting caveat to that is that we found that uh, Saturday night at um, between 6 and 7 p.m., uh, we saw kind of saw peak, dis peak dis discharge because that tended to be when uh, the hotel was most full and people were coming back from the beach and taking showers and things. And that when we built it for 6,000 gallons, we actually had to increase the size a little bit uh, by say another 1,000 gallons uh, to accommodate for that peak flow. And so, because most of the time, wastewater is designed for averages and not, not the peak flow. So anyway, um, next, next slide. Uh, so you can see here, here's the practice and um, you can see the vetiver grass. Uh, we also used a lot of organic material. Um, we excavated about three feet into the ground. We used a liner. Um, and these um, plants uh, can take up to a, ha a half a liter a day. Each mature vetiver plant can take up to a half a liter a day. 
So again, we're able to, during average conditions, we're able to have this system be a zero discharge system. And then when we hit those peak flow times, we do have to uh, release some of that water to the groundwater or to, um, yeah, to the groundwater essentially um, via uh, like a drain uh, drainage pipes that go into the ground. Next. And um, I, another aspect is uh, we did some initial monitoring. We had about four or five paired samples uh, that we took at, at that last site in Puerto Rico. And we saw between 40 and 60% removal of nitrogen and phosphorus. I think it averaged around 55. Um, and, and, and I think one thing we didn't uh, measure was the actual volume reduction. So we saw uh, a large volume reduction of effluent and um, and I think that's one of the most important things. Concentration is one thing, but the loads are really driven by the volume. And so with this project uh, at University of Hawaii, um, we're actually monitoring uh, the discharge as well as the, as the concentration. So we'll be able to um, be able to show exactly how much evapotranspiration we're able to get as those vetiver uh, grasses mature. So with that, um, we should have some data from this within the next six months. And uh, with that, I'll pass, I'll pass the torch. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paul. Jackie, passing it over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm joining you from Darwin, Australia, so it's quite early. Uh, my presentation is on fecal sludge management and coral reefs in Dar es Salaam. So prior to my position at the University of Sydney, I worked for a um, not-for-profit research institute called Ifakara Health Institute, which is based in Tanzania. Um, my background is as an engineer and sort of sanitation specialist, um, so less on the, the coral reef ecology. But Dar es Salaam is an interesting place because it's part of the East African coral reef system. Um, you can see just even from this, this satellite picture that there's quite a number of coral reefs sitting quite close to the main city. And the Zanzibar, Pemba and Mafia Islands um, are only about 50 kilometres offshore. Now, the reefs for Dar es Salaam and this part of East Africa um, are very important as a food resource, so fisheries, and also a very you know, important component of tourism. Um, a lot of tourists come especially to the islands to dive. So the dilemma with a city like Dar es Salaam is it's big. So it's got a population of 4.5 million. That's the actual recorded population. It's likely higher down just by you know, numbers of people that aren't you know, formally kind of recorded. And the city is quite interesting because it only has 10% um, sewerage coverage. And that is very typical of East African cities. So generally the sewer network extends in the city area, basically the old colonial parts of the city. Now everybody else, that's 90% of the population, are on on-site systems. Um, the breakdown further is, is that of the total population, 20% are on septic tanks of varying standards, and the remaining 70% of the population are on pit latrines, so unlined pit latrines. So this is the challenge that we presented. Um, next slide, please. So this just this is looking down in a full pit latrine. So this is, oh, you're back one if you can. Um, so the first image you can see there is a full pit latrine. And this is very typical. Um, the pit, pit latrines fill up. Often there's no roofs over the latrines. And so they just inundate with water. Um, these are unlined systems. And the common practice when these pit latrines become full because it costs money to pay someone to come and empty them is people will um, find ways to leach their pits, so often dig into the side of their pitch. The practice is called belching, and you allow the full pit content to flow out, um, generally after a heavy rainfall event, and often in the direction of the many streams that lead into the main river systems in Dar es Salaam. 
So you can see here, this picture in the middle is a wastewater impacted stream. It's also solid waste impacted. And this is very typical. Um, this stream is running through the back of an informal community, but with 90% of the population on on-site systems, this is a very common site. And there's three main river systems that run through the city of Dar es Salaam, um, all leading to the coast. So all this wastewater, um, both you know, active releases through these emptying practices, um, and then also you know, surface, subsurface flow, um, all end up in these river systems and end up flowing out um, onto the, the coral reefs. So the third picture there is a wastewater treatment pond. This is the formal place where um, the government you know, allows wastewater treatment. There was a series of waste stabilization ponds and they're built in the 1960s. And you can just see here, what I've got the picture of is the loading um, place. So this is where large vacuum tankers come to dump their loads. But you can see here that the pond is already, it's, it's completely um, filled. So you can see that there's grass growing right over the top. That should not be the case. So it's basically it hasn't been desludged in a very long time. This is a nature-based solution that is no longer working. So the solutions for people, even if they do pay to have their waste moved, are quite substandard. So we, in partnership with an NGO called Border, which specialises in sanitation, um, applied for and were successful in receiving money from the Human Development Innovation Fund, which is a UK aid funded um, program. Next slide, please. All right, so the treatment system. Um, I'll just work from left to right. So we have an emptying service because most of these pit latrines um, are not close enough to big roads where you can get in large vacuum tankers. So you can see here small sort of three wheel motorcycle take, takes about 0.5 cubic meters of fecal sludge, which is pumped out. The system could also take small vacuum tankers, which generally pump out um, the septic systems because generally households have septics have more money. So though that fecal sludge, and we call this fecal sludge not sewerage because we're not connected to a sewer network. So we only become sewerage when we go to a sewer network. So this is all just straight from, you know, on-site sanitation in. The treatment system is an anaerobic digester. This one here is four cubic meters. It's designed to treat um, waste from about 3,000 people in the local area. So we're looking at decentralized solutions. The product from this is biogas, which can be used for cooking. Um, also biosolids, which can be dried and used in agriculture and the effluent goes out into a, a banana plantation and we were involved heavily in the monitoring. Now obviously this particular system, um, what we generally do is because there's so many people and really we're only servicing 3,000 households, when we monitor we don't get these clear kind of boundaries of like great, the you know, stream water has been reduced in its E. coli levels and things, but what we can see is we definitely reduce the quantity of illegal emptying so this belching and you know just water being um, sludge being dumped into the local river system, and that's it. Great, thanks, Jackie. Um, panelists, please all turn your cameras on for our panel. And Steph, I'll pass it over to you to begin our discussion. Thanks, Kristen. Um, thank you everyone so much for those, I know, very brief but um, really valuable um, presentations and just overviews of some of the work you've been doing. Um, I, I mean, each time I hear about these things and hear about these, this work, I realize how important this is to be sharing and I'm glad for us to have so many people here today um, that are taking this in. So I have a couple of questions for you, and then we are, as Kristen said, going to open it up to the audience. Um, and because we are time limited, I'm going to ask you guys to remember to keep your answers to, you know, two minutes max. Um, okay, so my first question, I'm going to start with uh, Jenny. And the question, and actually I want all of you to answer this if you have an answer for it. If you don't, you can just say pass. Um, so the first question is, what tools or methods did your team consider to be the most influential at tackling your ocean sewage pollution problem? And I think, Jenny, you may have wanted to speak to governance around this, but um, yeah. So this is a question for everyone, but feel free to make it your own. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, it's, it's really important to have good governance because you can build the treatment plants, but if nobody is running it, it's just a wasted, uh, you know, wasted investment. There are so many treatment plants around Honduras that are just sitting there not being used. So it's really important to figure out what the management model is going to be. So not only the technical solution, 
but also who is going to run it and how is it going to be run in a way that will continue to generate funds so there can be still improvement into the system and improvement and manage it adequately. So we really focused on two building capacity of the POLOS, which is the, the wastewater and potable water management entity. And we also built the capacity for BICA, which is the Bay Island Conservation Association, because now they're doing the water quality monitoring. So we were able to support them with a lab so they can also be like ensuring that everything is, is uh, working adequately and really focusing on that management model. And every place is different. And so there's not just one cookie cutter way of, of um, designing that. It is, it is the key. <laughs> Great. Okay. How about you, Jackie, in terms of tools and um, methods, which did you consider to be the most influential in tackling the, the problem? Yeah, so leading on from Jenny's comment, it's um, stakeholder engagement. So, and that's everyone. So that's from the users, that's from the households that might use the service. It's from the local government. It's from, you know, higher levels of government that have to sign off on these things. And that stakeholder engagement is quite a long process and you really need to understand what the barriers are. And a lot of the barriers are really based around people's lack of understanding about the systems. And so when we approached communities and say, hey, we wanna build this you know, decentralized, below ground, you know, anaerobic digester, for them, all they're looking at is those big waste stabilization ponds that smell and are full of sludge and are not working. And so it takes such a long time to kind of help people kind of understand that there's an alternate system that isn't going to make the community smelly and is actually going to offer um, you know, a lot of benefits. Great. So I'm actually, I am wondering, Paul, if you might have a little bit of a different take on this because you are working with an individual uh, company, for lack of a, a business, and working sure. with them to solve a problem. So what do you, what do you have on that? Sure. I, I think one of the things that we tend to do and one of the important tools for us is really that targeting tool. So, you know, we're looking at a whole water, taking a whole watershed approach, kind of ridge to reef approach. And, and what we tend to find is that there's, there may be 20 problems like this, or, you know, 50 problems or 10 or, you know, whatever the number is. And it's really important to kind of quantify those and understand them and then you know develop appropriate solutions for each each one of them so for example uh, there was a wastewater plant that handles between 800,000 and a million gallons a day and so it, one of the designs for that was actually creating treatment wetlands for you know a bigger problem like that five and a half acres of treatment wetlands and then you know there were other instances where we were building floating wetlands in, in a unique system where it was stormwater being mixed with uh, groundwater or wastewater kind of in the streets. So that it just lent itself to uh, floating wetlands that were so so again, I think had we not done that portion where we were sort of cataloging those uh, key opportunities, then you know we likely would have missed. Um, some of those problems and and failed to define like the actual problems. And then uh, the other thing I would say is that we look toward nature-based solutions. Um, and I think because, because of their low cost and because all we're trying to do is just replicate what nature does really well already. And I think by integrating plants, we're able to really re and and really focusing on evapotranspiration and bacterial processes, we're able to really reduce the, the amount of of effluent, the amount of waste that's you know even treated waste is still like ten thousand times higher than a, than a coral reef needs in terms of nitrogen, the amount of nitrogen that's in that um, water. So it's very significant. Um, uh, to have even treated wastewater getting into a water body. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that um, we had a good partner in the hotel because they're taking care of the system. It's relatively easy to take care of, um, but they see it as an amenity. Um, and how many times can you say wastewater has now become an amenity because it actually is pretty, it functions, um, you know, we planted hibiscus flowers in there as well, and and they take care of it. They treat it like they're landscaping. 
And so th that's been a real plus um, because of course these things uh, may not do well over time if they're not maintained. So uh, that would be the last thing I'd say, thanks. Great. I think you bring up a really important point that is is it's important for people to appreciate is even when uh, wastewater is treated to some of the highest levels, it still may have too much nitrogen in it for coral reef systems because they're so sensitive to those kinds of additions. Um, okay, so next round um, of questions, and we're doing great on time, so thank you guys. Um, this one, um, you can go a little deeper on if you like. Really would love to hear what the greatest lesson learned was for you in this particular in the particular project that you shared. Um, let's start with Jackie. Yeah, um, it's operation and maintenance is the greatest lesson learned. So when you build these things, you need to have a 20, 30 year plan for them um, or whatever the life of the infrastructure is. And there's kind of a critical transition point between, you know, often these projects are donor funded in some way, whether it be through fundraising or through, um, you know, actual grants and those type of things. And that transition point, when you actually go, who's going to run this? And is it something that can be standalone and be run by a local entrepreneur? Or are we going to hand it over to local government or the water utility? And do they even have the capacity, the willingness or the money to keep this running and so that's really critical and look I know this project which I just presented that's been a real stumbling point for us so I'm talking about you literally have contracts with local government drawn up before you even build the thing and that you capacity build and that I really think that the granting cycle if you're getting this you're doing this type of work through grants is too short so three to five years is too short to make these things really work so you need to work with donors, I think, or, or those fundraising components or, or piece together fundraising to go, right, okay, you build, but then we need the operation and maintenance budget. Um, and that needs to be something that we're looking at, you know, for decades. And this is the difficult thing, especially in very low income countries, like in Tanzania, the government will just always turn around and say, we don't have any money to do that. So the money has gone somewhere else. Yeah, it sounds like, um, well, not unlike many other kinds of conservation efforts and interventions where you really need to, it's not just a one off, there's a long term commitment to addressing those, whatever the issue is. Um, and also maybe a need for conservation, some, some finance, some creative finance around it to make it sustainable so that you're not relying on a government that's functioning 20 years from now to make sure it's paid for. Um, so that's, yeah, that's a really, I've been hearing a lot more on operation and maintenance and trying to get familiar with it. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, Jenny, what um, has been your greatest lesson learned? I know you've been working on this project for a long time. A long time, yes. So my greatest lesson learned is time and patience. <laughs> because since 2005, we've been making this happen slowly but surely. And just as, as Jackie was mentioning, it really is about including everybody and that stakeholder engagement and you know what because basically what we're asking of people is to change their behaviors and that takes a lot of time and if this change of behavior is also coming to a cost to them because now they have to pay another fee to manage their water you know those are, are things that are are slow and you have to bring everybody on board um and again, my other lesson learned is collaboration with all entities, everybody, NGO, community, um, you know, organizations, government, and even private sector, because if you don't have everybody on board and everybody's collaborating with you, you're not going to, to get very far, for sure. Um, and those things take a lot of time to create those really uh, trusting bonds. And so I guess the, that's the, the, you know, be patient and you can make it and make sure that you involve everybody because if not, you won't have that good governance model and you, know, you won't have something that can be sustained over time. Yeah, again, something that um, folks that work in conservation are all too familiar with. Nothing happens very fast. You have to just keep plugging along. Um, yep, it's, it's definitely not instant gratification. Um, Paul, what about you? Greatest lessons learned in the work that you've done there or, I mean, in related projects even? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think I mentioned this before, but I think we spent a few years just 
looking at these problems, uh, you know, every every watershed that I've ever worked in in the tropics, and and I would even extend that into more temperate areas, they've all had problems with wastewater, whether it's septic systems leaching nitrogen into the Chesapeake Bay, or if um, you know wastewater and cesspools in Hawaii injection wells. Um, it, Every one I've ever worked in ha has significant problems in terms of sewage pollution. And I think at, at some point we got tired of looking at it and we said, look, we need to apply our skills. Um, and you know, some of our skills were more in stormwater and, and agricultural pollution, but we had to take those that same skill set and start to apply it to wastewater and not just and not just kind of be a, a bystander. And I think a lot of the same sort of engineering calculations um, come into play. And, and I think we, we just had to sort of get over that threshold of, okay, we're gonna uh, take a stand and actually do something about these problems and develop, um, frankly, new solutions to old problems, um, but really just using nature um, and getting away a little bit from some of the, again, with these decentralized, relatively small systems, um, it doesn't have to be over, it doesn't have to be super, it doesn't have to be over engineered with concrete and other types of things. It, it can be a low tech, really high function solution where we're getting almost no discharge during, during typical conditions. And I think that's, you know, that's the gold standard that I want to get to is the more we can create systems that, that end up with almost zero discharge, the better we're going to be in terms of reefs, so. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really important for people to appreciate. I continue to come across folks that think that the gold standard or the the thing they're going for is a big central sewer system with a big wastewater treatment plant and that that is going to be effective. And more, more and more, we really are appreciating that that isn't necessarily the best option. The water isn't necessarily in the best condition um, and or safe for coral reefs or other habitat types and decentralized smaller scale really might be your best option um, and and your gold standard so it's important for people to explore lots of different um, solutions for whatever it is they're they're facing um, so and and we will be providing lots of examples to folks through our case studies and other types of um, resources for people to explore one, the different types of options. One little addition yeah. to that, I would say, is that at certain densities, like the densities that Jacqueline is dealing with, um, it it may be impossible to use decentralized systems. So so I think it's 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 understanding what what's appropriate where, and when we get to certain densities. We, ha we probably have to move to more centralized systems if we don't have the space to, to do decentralize, you know, to decentralize it in, in a city um, right. and, and very tight quarters. Um, some right. of this can be done at relative, at tighter quarters, but there's, there's a certain uh, threshold that you get beyond, you really can't do it on site, I don't think. Yeah, I'd love for Jackie to respond yeah, to that. Yeah, yeah we'll actually, if that's okay. Um, so Paul, I think sometimes when we talk about decentralized, it's like, how decentralized is it? And I know we often kind of, you know, I think your system with the hotel is very clear. It's, you know, it's a single entity serving the, the hotel as a decentralized system. But the system that we built um, servicing 3000 households is still classed as a decentralized system because it's, it's only servicing a subset of the population and it's actually contained within itself. So in dense urban areas, that is, it is workable, but definitely what's not workable at all is thinking about putting in sewer networks. That is just, it's, it's impossible. So that's kind of what people often think about, but that's the centralized system. But a decentralized okay. system where you're having transport of fecal sludge from the home, to the treatment system um, is, is definitely workable and it's definitely a model that we are looking at as really one of the most viable options in, in, big, in big urban centers. 
So, but so Jacqueline, and, thing, it's kind of people have different scales. So, yeah. Yep. So, so Jacqueline, and what you're talking about is, does that mean essentially people get their systems pumped out and then taken, or the sludge gets taken out of their systems and then taken to the treatment plant or the treatment area? Yes, I I I, I agree that 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 makes sense. And so it's not always about sort of centralization in terms of putting pipes in all the streets. It's about sort of centralization of that treatment. Um, that's a very good point. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it really is interesting when you start to get into this around the world, the different solutions that people come up with, depending on the density of the population and the space available to treat. And um, this, the yeah, so I appreciate that, Jackie, in terms of, um, I think sometimes people think of decentralized as like on site for an individual home or an individual business, and it can have a much greater, um, serve a much greater population. Um, so, okay, final question. Um, we have like one minute a piece, roughly, for this one. Um, what advice would you give reef managers or practitioners that are interested in addressing this problem? Maybe it's a little bit of encouragement or you know, who you wanna work with, anything that you wanna start with. Let's, let's go with you, Jenny. We haven't heard from you in a bit. Okay, well, yes, please get involved. <laughs> we are too few and this is a really big problem, but it can be solved. So you, you clearly see there are three case studies here that show that you can do it. So please, please get involved. Um, and make this a priority. And the other thing I would like to say is that it's really important to have, at least in our case with the ocean, is to have that water quality data. Um, because if you strategically share it and you use it as a tool to bring people on board and show them the differences and show them what can happen, um, you know, it, it's, um, it's much clearer and much easier to, show, to showcase the results and to try and replicate them in other areas. So water quality monitoring is very important. Sorry, I was muted. Paul. <laughs> um, I want to echo some of what Jenny said. I think, um, you know, one of the reasons we were able to convince the hotel to do something was that um, they're a waterfront hotel and they're on a bay. So it's not like there's that much swimming or a beach, but the water was so polluted outside of just outside of there that that it did smell it, it did look discolored sometimes and um and so this was an investment in their own um financial success and their own success as a hotel and so um i think i think that water quality data and how high the levels of fecal bacteria and e coli were you know that that's a health risk um and that's a water contact recreation risk because they wanted people to be able to get in kayaks and those sorts of things. And, and really, it was dangerous to get in kayaks there, frankly. And I think that they were kind of hiding the water a little bit uh, in some ways because and they there was even a sign that said the water was contaminated. So, you know, how many people want to stay in a hotel that there's a sign that says the water is contaminated? And um, so I think that that's a really important important point. I think the other thing is just just to do it. I think I think the main thing is when you see I, it's important to do something about these problems and and look around the world and see what's worked in other places and and mimic one of those strategies or or sort of blend a couple of your own and and really start managing the problem. So and get Thank stakeholders you, involved. Thank you. Thanks. Jackie, advice. I know you are the yes. sort. This is like your bread. Oh. This is what you do. Yeah. And so, look, if, yeah. If, if you're looking for a partner, make sure you find an expert who's got runs on the ground, like, and actually go and look at what they've built and see if it's still working. Because um, there's this perception that somehow building something which is more nature based is easy. It couldn't be further from the truth. You know, it's so complicated and the systems need to be balanced. And, and as Paul Pell pointed out, you know, all the calculations about the loading and it's you really need an expert. It's not something that you can do from, you know, some theory. Um, the other thing, too, is you need experts who have done work in your region. 
So getting an expert out of North America to try and do work in a region that they've never worked in, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. There's just so many complicating factors about what Jenny's spoken about, you know, people and their behavior and the politics and lack of standards and things. You really need to find the right people. I've seen a lot of failed projects around the world where people have had good ideas and said, yeah, I can build a biogas reactor or I can build this and just made so many errors that the systems just fail almost immediately, which is really bad for the sanitation sector because then those things are sitting there as white elephants and giving a really bad reputation. And so when you come back and say, hey, we're gonna build another set, like sanitation system, everyone's like, no, 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 we got burnt by the last one. Um, or, you know, it's still sitting there, an absolute mess, just go away. So it's, it's such a critical sector in that space. That is a really important point, Jackie. I'm gonna turn it over to everybody, um, for, or to Kristen to, to get other questions in, but I just wanna highlight what you said. And one of the things that we are working to do is to support this community. We are not advocating that coral reef practitioners go out and become sanitation experts and build their own sanitation systems. We are very much um, trying to get this community fluent in this in the language of this and the technology so they can be good partners to those experts that actually are working in the sanitation and wash space we have a, a webinar later this year um, on demystifying wash which for those of you that have never heard of wash it's water and sanitation and hygiene if i got that wrong i'm sorry i try for some reason the h always throws me i want to say health um, but um, this is really important. We, it's about partnership and we're trying to be good partners. We're trying to be good partners to the WASH community and those that are really working on these problems so that um, these can get, this can get done the right, the right way the first time in these communities. It's so very much need um, this kind of support. So Kristen, I want, I mean, I, we can keep going unless you have questions. Yeah, there are a couple questions that have come in, so maybe we can pivot to those and that can spur conversations. So just as a reminder for those in the audience, please feel free to type your question into the question box and I can share it with our panelists or go ahead and hit that little hand icon next to your name and we can unmute you and you can ask your question aloud yourself. Um, so I'm just going to jump right to the couple questions that came in. So, Jackie, this one's for you. What challenges did you experience in convincing local authorities slash communities to apply the effluent to the banana fields in Africa? How did you overcome these challenges? What lessons did you learn that might be applicable in the U.S.? Yeah, so the, the effluent leach fields were quite small. So they were on the plot of land that had already been allocated for the wastewater treatment plant. So these are not there. I mean, the, the biggest system we built was 10 cubic meters. So the effluent field for that is, you know, it's, it's no more than 50 by 100 meters square. So it's, it's, it wasn't, we weren't asking it to go onto anyone else's crops. It was either we had different models. So sometimes it was a private entrepreneur, so it was their land and they were running the systems. And sometimes it was government land. So it was part of the treatment system. Um, and the person who ate the bananas was normally the people working there. So they would see it as a bonus to their, their, their work scenario. Great, thanks Jackie. And feel free um, to type in an early, uh, I'm sorry, a follow-up question if we if you have additional questions following that. Okay, this is a question, well, Paul or others, are you aware of um, Madro Atoll in Marshall Islands? using saltwater wastewater system separate from the main public water system with deep ocean outfall. This was installed decades ago. Do you know if it's still working? Um, I'm not necessarily um, aware of the exact system that they're using there for wastewater, but but um, ocean, ocean discharges are, are relatively, I, I don't know if I would say common, but they're relatively common and um, they usually only treat the water partially, um, sometimes barely at all. And so, you know, it's, it's just kind of extending the problem to somewhere else. 
uh, rather than sort of addressing it where it needs to be addressed. Um, and I know that, that some of these systems, some of the treatment systems can work in sort of brackish water. Um, and, but one of the things that we try to do, even if we have to build an elevated system, is to try not to, we want to treat the water before we allow it to mix with the groundwater or coastal water. Um, and we really want to keep it separate until we're ready to sort of release it. Um, and so, so anyway, those are just a couple perspectives. Sorry, I don't know more um, about what's specifically being done in those areas, but be happy to to look into it a bit. Kristen, I can speak a little bit to that. Like I haven't seen the system, but my understanding is one of the challenges with the ongoing operation of of it was especially in people's toilets. So the like the toilet mechanisms, because obviously the salt water is quite corrosive. So that to make the system sort of sustainable, is there was um, they needed to support households more to kind of change over their system so they didn't have any corrosive parts, especially in their like flush mechanisms or, you know, toilet um, components, which most, most didn't. But I mean, look, it, it's a great solution because it, it makes use of a resource. You know, fresh water is very scarce in those islands, um, very scarce. Their freshwater aquifers are normally sometimes you know, impacted by saltwater intrusion and, you know, drinking water is very precious. So to have a system working off what is a much more available resource um, made sense. I agree with the deep ocean outfall um, issues that Paul raised, and that is always a, a constant issue with those. But, you know, it's one of these kind of incremental steps things. Look, it's not the perfect solution, but it's far better than what, you know, was happening with people's on-site systems just leaching straight out into the ocean or, or a lot of open defecation on the beaches. Thanks, Jackie. Anyone else have something to add before I move to the next? I saw a lot of heads nodding. Just that that is a, that the ocean outfall is a common uh, tool still used, or I don't know what to call it. I wouldn't say it was useful really, because it is, I mean, Florida still has six ocean outfall pipes in South Florida that they're trying to get rid of because the public found out about it and was very upset. Um, it was primary treated sewage, or it is primary treated sewage, which means they're just removing solids before it gets put into the ocean. Um, so it's not, it's, it's a, it, this is a common practice. It's something that we encourage folks to find out if it's happening where you are. It, it's, it's, it usually takes some detective work because um, it's invisible. So I would just encourage people to, get to know what's going on wherever they are so they can appreciate what kind of challenges they have ahead um, and and know that you may discover some things that you had no idea were happening in the places that you live and work. Thank you. Jenny, this one is for you. What is the percentage decrease in macroalgae after sewage treatment was established in Roatan? I, I just didn't catch the number and wanted to learn more. It was from 27 to 24. Great. Thank you. Anything else you want to share about that? Again, you know, we have enough results on the reef to really understand that this is important. Um, and all of the all of the solutions and the actions you're going to do are cumulative. So could the, could the um, decrease in, uh, in macroalgae be also because it's in a no-take area and parrotfish are protected? You know, you're, you're, I don't think sometimes it's, it's easy to attribute, but I think with all of the different sum of the results and the, and the, and the quality and then the reef health and the disease, you can, you know, it proves itself. And a, another question just came in for you, Jenny, so I'll, I'll keep you on. Is there an ongoing program to rigorously monitor the quality of the treated water in Roatan? If so, is the government or a private entity do the sampling and analysis? Good question. <laughs> so um, it's, it's going back to that same thing with governance, because hotels here, they do have some of the treatment systems, but then, you know, they're not managed adequately, and so nobody really knows. So what we've, what we've been doing is setting up the Beca Laboratory and the Bay Island Conservation Association so that they can take that on as one of the legal co-managers for the Bay Islands National Marine Park. 
And so they have uh, offices in each one of the islands and they're training up each one of their staff as well in, in the other areas so we can really understand what's happening. And the truth is we trust Bika's um, results even more than the national lab. So yeah, that's, that was part of it, building that capacity. Okay. This is a tech question. Does anyone have recent updates about real-time biosensors or rapid bacterial detention tech? Jackie, I feel like that's a you area. Look, the, the water, so we're talking about things like Delphia and, you know, little water fleas and stuff that respond quite rapidly. Um, look, the inline monitoring components, and you look at, you know, I guess, wastewater treatment and water treatment, um, in more developed countries, it's definitely getting there. We're still, there is some tech that's looking a little bit promising for rapid E. coli detection, because obviously the standard methods is a 24 hour or 18 to 24 hour incubation, which is quite difficult, you know, but difficult, it just sort of doesn't allow you to really capture exactly what's going on right at that moment, which can be quite important for um, some types of monitoring. So look, it's, as far as I'm aware, is that the technology in terms of rapid E. coli detection, it's sitting there in you know, a research space. I think it's still going to be a number of years before you start seeing standard methods adopt because most of the rapid tech involves some, at the moment, quite expensive reagents. So they're either enzymatic or partial sort of DNA type tests. Yeah, standard methods are slow to change, sadly. Thanks, Jackie. Anyone have anything else to add on tech? No, that was pretty. <laughs> um, so this is a, well, a comment and a question. One of the challenges has been getting information on examples like these um, excellent solutions. Are these examples available as case studies? These are the types of experiences we would like to be able to share. And, we, we mentioned it this at the beginning, but worth saying again, so these three projects, you know, this, this work will be featured in case studies in the Reef Resilience Network case study database. And so we can go ahead and put that link um, to the case study database page in our chat box. Um, but it is a searchable database, so you can go ahead and put in the word sewage. And any of our sewage case studies, once they are up there, will pop up. Um, and the case studies are intentionally quite brief just to be able to make them as useful as possible. So kind of like we did today, you know, what is the challenge you're experiencing? What was done to address that challenge? What are some lessons learned? How did you fund the work? You know, the, the, the key points that are important for reef managers. Um, so we will get you that link. Um, um, can I just add to that? So there's a great community in sanitation and they have a fantastic online resource, which is called the Sustainable Sanitation Alliance. The acronym is SUSANA, spelled with S's, S-U-S-A-N-A. -S -A. Um, that is a fantastic platform. Anyone can join. Um, there is a sort of, you do sort of sign up and then there's a, it's free, but there's a whole resource section, which is just people's case studies, um, there's very active discussions and chats there. I guarantee nearly any question you have, if you search the um, discussion forums, you'll find some people who've spoken about it. And that's also a great place to connect with people um, on uh, regarding their work. So it's a really good place to look at, you know, who are the sanitation people working in my region um, and, you know, what, what organisations, those type of things. So Susanna, I can look up and we are, share the web. We are actually going to be, Susanna is a group that we are very interested in and are looking at um, actually partnering and connecting with the Sustainable Sanitation Alliance. And we are um, going to be providing um, that kind of information on the Reef Resilience website soon, but it would be great to, you, you can, um, if you want to put in the, I don't know if you can put in the chat, Jackie, because we don't have access to the chat, Kristen. We can go ahead and share that with the resource link. Okay. Or, or the yeah. resource list that we'll be emailing. Yeah. It was just, and it, this is actually perfect timing because we're at the, yeah. the top of the hour. So we will go ahead and just wrap the discussion. Um, sorry to have to do that. We can continue the Q&A on the Reef Resilience Network Forum. 
So that is our interactive online community of reef practitioners, managers, experts. There is the link there. We will be sending out as soon as um, we're able to process the recording, we'll send out an email to everyone on our email listserv with the recording of this webinar and any relevant resource links. And so for all of our panelists, if there's any extra links you'd like to share, please get them to us and we'll be sure um, that they go out to everyone who's attended this webinar and to our broader mailing list. Um, we also, at the, the end of the webinar, a short survey will go out. So please, um, attendees, share feedback on this webinar, share feedback on other sewage-related topics you'd like to learn more about. Um, big thank you to all of our panelists um, and to our moderator. Really appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise with our network. Um, yeah, and so big thank you. Any closing words or final comments before we wrap? No? Okay. Thank you so much. And yeah, expect an email from us soon. All the best. Thanks, everybody.